Um, and before we get started, here's my, here's a little joke for all of you. And I won't even know if you think it's funny because I'll have no response, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh, what kind of insulin does a pirate use? Humulin R. And with that, I throw it over to Lorraine. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Tina. Um, so I am, like all of you, just getting used to this new format. So I'm going to ask for your, uh, um, uh, your forgiveness in advance. I have to also have two unsupervised golden retrievers in the next room who um, may make their presence known. So uh, apologies for that in advance as well. Okay, I have a lot of content that I uh, want to share with you today. I do have to disclose that I have a personal bias really favoring diabetes technology. Um, I am not an, an innovator or even really an early adopter, but um, I learned this new terminology. I might be dating myself a little bit here, but I knew, learned this new terminology uh, this week from my kids that I, I do have a FOMO or a fear of missing out. So. I'm the, the, the kind of um, tech person that I'm not the first one to dive in, but if I feel like I'm missing out on something, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure it out. And I can say that technology has changed my uh, diabetes experience over, I have to update my bio too, because it's actually 32 years now. So I think I need to make some changes there. Um, but um, in terms of further disclosures, as, as many of you know, I am a former employee of Animus Canada, so I have lots of experience in the um, industry side of diabetes, uh, as well as with every presentation, please don't uh, take anything I say and go run out and buy new technology or insulin or anything like that. You always have to consult with your personal medical team. A lot of the information or most of the information that I'm going to be sharing actually uh, comes from uh, Connected in Motion was able to participate in the most recent uh, ATTD conference, Advances in, in Technology and Therapeutics in Diabetes, that was just in Madrid in uh, a couple of weeks before this whole COVID-19 thing blew up. And so it is sort of the most up-to-date that, that I've been able to find. Everything that I'm presenting is available publicly. I have no inside scoop on, on things at all. Um, and uh, I would encourage you, because everyone in this room, first of all, for you to, to attend a technology presentation in the middle of the day uh, on a weekend, um, you guys are probably going to be more uh, of those early adopters and, and, and keen, and keen, um, and keen folks. Um, so, but I do want you to encourage you to share in the chat box if there's something that I miss on a particular product or something that you want to make sure is shared with everyone, please jump in, share your personal knowledge experience. Um, I think that will only make this whole session um, a lot better. Just know though, I can't see the chat. So discuss behind me and that's, that's all cool too. Uh, and when I think back to the uh, tools that were first available back in 1988, and I look at what we have available to us now, um, as much as it sounds like a bit of an oxymoron to say, but there's never been a better time to have type 1 diabetes. Um, we are very fortunate not only to have a number of different options in all aspects of technology, um, but we can also, you know, use those, those different features of different devices to sort of personalize what works best for, for each of us individually. Because, you know, what might be number one for me in terms of my most important criteria for a particular tool that I might use, maybe not even on the radar for some of you. So we all have things there. I don't believe there's any really perfect product. We all have things that we'd like to see um, in the devices that we use. Um, but you know, overall, I have to, we have to acknowledge how lucky we are to see uh, what we do have available today. Okay, so we're gonna talk about insulin delivery, lots on automation, cover glucose monitoring, which is obviously very closely tied in with automation, and a little glimpse on you know, what's next in the world uh, of diabetes technology. So just a little bit about you so I know who I'm talking to. Um, I use the following tools to manage my type 1 diabetes, uh, multiple daily injections, an insulin pump, um, MDI with a CGM, a pump and a CGM, or I use a pump, a CGM, and a hybrid closed loop systems, hybrid closed loop system. And 
I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to see the results. I think so. You will. I'm just waiting. There's a couple more people still to answer. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have some MDI, some pump. This is actually going to help me on uh, gear where to focus my content. Uh, an insulin pump in CGM, and then we do have about a third of the group uh, using uh, a pump, CGM, and hybrid closed loop system. Very cool. Okay, I'm going to move on. And just my second question, this will be the end for polls, um, but when it comes to new technology, Please describe yourself for me. I am an innovator. I seek out new things and I am the first to try the latest and greatest. I am an early adopter. I like to try new things after I see that my super keen innovator friends like them. I'm an early majority. I will try new things after the innovators and early adopters as they become more the norm. I'm in the late majority. I approach new things with a high degree of skepticism and after the majority of people have already adopted it, or I have an aversion to change and I like to stick with what I know. I'm gonna guess that we have some A, Bs and Cs in this group, um, but maybe a couple that are you know, more, uh, more averse to change. Ah, okay, so I, the, the bulk of, of the group, almost half of us are saying that you're kind of like me, I will try new things after the innovators and the, and the early adopters as we be, become more comfortable um, with, with the norm. Very interesting. Okay, so let's uh, dive ahead. Um, you know what, we all know what it is that we're trying to achieve with type one diabetes. Um, I, I, I'd like to think that uh, our, it, I, I, I use the analogy of walking along a tightrope where we know that if we start to sway too far on one side of the tightrope, you know, we're risking hypoglycemia. If we start to, you know, to, to our balance, lose our balance on the other side of the, on the tightrope, then we're risking high blood sugars and, and the, the sequelae of that. Um, and so we're trying to stay as straight as possible on this tightrope while, you know, maximizing our quality of life. And what do I mean by that? I, I really mean minimizing the impact that diabetes has every single day, because um, I think none of us wants anything more than to have a day that comes where we just don't have to think about this. Um, I have a friend that was able to be a, a study participant in um, one of Ed Damiano's bionic pancreas trials about five years ago. And I remember on the last day of the study, she was posting her experience wearing this automated system. Um, and on the last day, the night before she had to take it off, she posted that, you know, she had tears in her eyes. And she said, for the first time in my life, I can envision the hope that there will be a day that I don't have to think about diabetes. And I think really that's, that's all we want to see. We want life to be as close to normal as possible with minimal impact on what we have to do every day to achieve that. And um, uh, we're moving quickly in that direction. And you know, many of you have heard the term that, that as people with type one diabetes, we make on average an extra 180 decisions every single day about how we manage. And the whole goal with automation and making, making our lives a little bit simpler is just, is just taking, you know, even, even if it's 150 of those decisions and, and making them decisions that we don't have to make anymore, that, that a very smart algorithm or computer, uh, you know, machine learning or, or, or an automated system can do, can do for us. And that's really the direction that, that things are going, which is super exciting. Okay, but how are we doing now? Uh, we're not doing so well. Uh, we are missing the boat somewhere. We have a little bit of Canadian data from a couple of years ago now, and it encompasses both type one and type two uh, diabetes. But about 30% of, of our population has an A1C sitting between seven and 8.5%. 15% uh, of us uh, have an A1C greater than 8.5%. If we look at some of the US data from the type one diabetes exchange, um, up to from 2016 to 2018, the most recent data that they have out there, only 17% of youth were achieving A1C target under 7.5%. And adults, only about a fifth of us or 20% of us were able to get an A1C under 7%. And these numbers are in fact a little bit worse than the, the, their previous um, data that was released uh, in, from 2010 to 2012. So 
we're not moving in the right direction despite increases in use of technology. And I think it only goes without saying that I think that technology is a, is a big help in helping us to, to do better. So why aren't we seeing that uh, in, in the numbers? That uh, I'll show you a little bit of a different look at it from the same data. If we look at mean A1C by use of technology across all age groups, it goes without saying that using um, MDI and CGM or a pump in CGM, the more technology that we are able to implement, um, the better the results overall, and that's across all age groups. So technology does make a difference. Okay, let's look at insulin delivery. Um, you've all seen photos of various formats of early insulin pumps. Um, thank goodness we're not in the day of wearing these massive devices and we've come a lot further ahead. Um, and we have four insulin pumps on the market available in Canada today. I, I, I stuck a little animus slide in there uh, only because I read of a friend uh, this week who just switched to another uh, insulin system from his animus pump on Friday. And so there are a few still stragglers hanging on out there, but most have transitioned to one of these other devices. Um, the Medtronic 670 really led the way in terms of technology in Canada with the first uh, hybrid closed loop system. So what does that mean? It means it has automated basal delivery um, that, will, that is in response to the glucose sensor reading. And so basal will go up when we need a little bit more. Basal comes down when, when, uh, when sensor readings indicate that a little bit less insulin is is needed. So the, the, the Medtronic 670, um, uh, you know, ha has led the way for, for automation uh, for insulin, certainly into Canada, and we'll see that a, a little bit further. Um, for people, for some people, the, the um, Omnipod, or the, the most important feature for, for some is just not being tethered, or the tubeless aspect of of, of insulin delivery uh, is very appealing. And so insulin's held in a small you know, patch that's worn on the body with a, a, a separate um, controller or personal diabetes manager that, that is used to automate all the, the functions or delivery of, of, of the pod. The newest player on the block uh, that recently achieved uh, ADP, uh, which is our uh, government funding program for insulin pumps in Ontario, uh, is a pump called the Ipso Pump by Ipsomed. It's a very simple, small, um, um, very sort of compact, um, easy to use uh, device, uses orbit infusion sets. And um, that one recently uh, came to market. Um, and um, last but not least is the Tandem T Slim X2. Uh, Tandem came to Canada just over a year ago. Um, uh, actually about a year ago, uh, this time of, of, of year, and um, most recently launched their Basil IQ technology. So as well as being small, con uh, color screen, touch screen, uh, like the Ipsa pump, um, the Basil IQ technology incorporates predictive low glucose suspend, which is, can be very helpful for mitigating, um, mitigating hypoglycemia. So um, uh, if, for those of you that replied that you're using a, an insulin pump in Canada, you are using one of these four uh, devices. Okay, when it comes to consideration, I don't wanna spend a lot of time here because you know it, many of you are already pumping and you've made these decisions about what's most important to you. I only put this list in here to highlight that um, there are many considerations and each of us will rank them differently in terms of level of importance. Um, and, and that the beauty is that we have so many options uh, to choose from in our diabetes toolbox. There are some challenges with pump therapy and some of the data that came out from the early trials with the Medtronic 670 system is that, you know, we program one set of basal rates, you know, maybe people have one or more insulin to carb ratios, maybe they have one maybe two different insulin sensitivity factors programmed into pumps. But we know that um, you know, within a, an individual 24 hour period, there's significant variability uh, of how much insulin we need. So when we, you know, when we look at just basal rates on somebody, most of us are on, on uh, just on, on you know, non-automated pumps. Um, it's not surprising that uh, that our, our, you know, things don't always work out as planned because our, our requirement for insulin varies quite significantly. On average, 30% overnight 
and 20% during waking hours. Um, so how do we you know, match that with this one set of basal rates? Some people will try different basal patterns or profiles, uh, but really the data suggests that you know, very few of us have success um, you know, using, using those types of patterns. And why does this happen? Well, we eat very differently every single day, different meal composition, um, certainly physical activity, uh, is one of the many things that impacts our insulin sensitivity. Um, just as women, you know, depending on what time of the month it is, um, we may need different different um, settings or different different insulin requirements. So, this is one of the challenges of of, of insulin therapy in general. Um, and you know, not only that, but we still have a problem with forgetting missed meal boluses uh, and, and forgetting um, to pre-bolus and, and how important it is, even with automated uh, systems, to give insulin a head start. As rapid as, as insulin is, as rapid as rapid insulin is, it really isn't rapid enough to fully you know, replicate what we see in somebody who has a normal functioning pancreas. So um, timing of meal boluses is, is particularly important. So the question is, is can automation solve some of these challenges? And I, I truly believe that it can. So what do we mean by automation? I know most of you are very familiar with this concept, but I will just explain that if you use an insulin pump and a CGM right now, but you are the one that's making the decisions sort of 24 seven about you know, increasing, decreasing, um, uh, when to give boluses, those sorts of things, you know, you are in an open loop world. Everything that you are in full control, uh, with the exception of program basal, uh, you're, you're in control of, of what's happening. We, as we move towards closed loop or artificial pancreas, bionic pancreas, um, you know, type technology, we see this continuous cycle of feedback where a sensor uh, glucose is giving a reading, it's sending that reading to the insulin delivery device. Inside the device is an algorithm that is then deciding, well, okay, I'm gonna put out this much insulin in response to that, that sensor uh, glucose reading. And that insulin delivery is sort of updating every five minutes, every, every, every three minutes, every 10 minutes, and, and making, making new decisions you know, as we go. So, you can see how this takes a lot of the burden off of the person with type 1 diabetes um, and, and makes, you know, hopefully it's going to make our lives uh, a, a lot easier. But what are we aiming for? So the question I ask is, is how good does this thing need to be? And I, I have to reflect on um, Stephen Russell. He works again with Ed Damiano uh, at Beta Bionics. And a number of years ago, he, um, he, he, he basically said that in all the work uh, with diabetes technology I've done, I've worn CGM for long periods of time, I do not have diabetes, but I'll eat a dessert and I'll go up to 11. I'll also drop down to 2.8 or 3.3. And people with diabetes are comparing themselves to a false standard. Uh, the pancreas for all of the advantages it has still allows big excursions. It's crazy to think it's ideal. And I think the reality is, is that we very often, you know, we don't very often put CGM on people who don't have diabetes. So when, you know, when it comes to deciding, well, how good does the system need to be? Certainly it needs to be safe, um, but, but how, you know, that finding that balance between, you know, optimal or minimal levels of hypoglycemia and also optimizing you know, diabetes management is a really a fine line and, and how good does it need to be? And I wonder whether, you know, with all the research and, and, and time that's going into developing these systems, is someday, you know, this automated system that I put on going to be, uh, you know, going to have less variability or be more flat and narrow and in range than, you know, my husband's CGM reading with, with his perfectly normal functioning pancreas. So it's an interesting uh, concept. So where are we at? The, the JDRF developed these, these six uh, stages of artificial pancreas device systems a number of years ago. Um, if we go back 10 years with the Medtronic VAO, it was the first low glucose suspend system to hit where if um, a user uh, hit a certain low threshold and an alarm went off and they didn't acknowledge that alarm, that the system could suspend for up to two hours um, and, and therefore with the idea of you know, helping to, to to pull them out of a, of a low that maybe they didn't respond to. Moving forward through the system, and I, I've put examples of these systems uh, under here. So hypoglycemia minimizer is really a predictive low glucose suspend, a system that can predict 30 minutes out, 
that that you might be going low and take action to um, to prevent that. And you know, I have 630 and basal IQ in the same category, but they are re really very different in how they in how they function. Um, those of you with familiarity and experience now with basal IQ will know that. Um, you'll know that, um, you know, basal IQ will do this without necessarily alerting you. So um, I think in, in terms of easing of burden, that that's a significant step. As we move more, you know, further down the pipe, um, we do now with the Medtronic 670 system have automated basal in a hybrid closed loop. What does that mean? Hybrid closed loop means we still need to intervene to enter carbohydrates. And whether we're going to be entering carbohydrates down the pipe, you know, into these other uh, uh, options is probably not going to be the case. But what type of meal announcement do we need to make? Maybe we're going to press a button once to say we're just having a snack or twice to say that we're having you know, an average size meal. Or maybe we press that button three times to say we're eating a big, big meal. Um, you know, it'd be very interesting to see um, as we move from the, the hybrid component of this and, and less interactivity or less involvement on our part, um, the better. Um, and, you know, um, with the 670, with uh, Tandem's Control IQ and with the, the DIY or Loop and Open APS systems that I'm, some of you may have heard um, Kate talk about this morning, um, these systems are, you know, at this level already. And in fact, uh, some of the uh, open source or do-it-yourself um, types of systems, you know, I don't know whether we can truly say that no dosing for meals, whether we're there yet. Maybe if you eat a low carb diet and there's some other things that, that are programmed into your settings, maybe you can honestly say that you don't need to, to dose for meals at this stage in the game, but the next step will be no requirement for, um, for food entry and, and, and bolus, um, you know, bolus delivery, uh, that should be automized as well. And then in the very end, I think what we're looking at is a fully automatic, we say multi-hormonal, so that means you know, insulin and glucagon more than likely, but maybe even including other hormones um, that, uh, that may help to optimize our diabetes management. And whether it's other hormones or we use things like inhaled insulins or some of the, the, the adjunctive therapies for type one diabetes. So, um, uh, some things that are right now approved and prescribed for type 2 diabetes, uh, those types of drugs might also help to optimize our management um, because I truly believe that insulin alone is, is not going to be enough, even at a fully closed loop system, but we'll see. Um, and interoperability or the ability of these devices to work um, in conjunction with each other is really important. So Tandem was the first insulin pump to receive this designation by the, AF, uh, by the FDA called alternate controller enabled, meaning it's an interoperable pump. It can be used with other devices, allowing us to, to tailor uh, or customize the tools that we use with our diabetes management. And it incorporates a whole number of different devices. And in order to achieve this, this, um, this clearance or this rating, uh, the, the device must meet certain criteria around reliability and cybersecurity and, 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 and accuracy as well. And just in October of, of or just a few months ago, the Omnipod Dash system was also granted this ACE, um, this ACE clearance. Uh, so it is you know, paving the way for their interoperable uh, automatic insulin delivery system. The one that they're making in-house is called the Omnipod Horizon, and I'll take a look at that in a second. So what's coming in automation? So we'll start with Medtronic. Um, Medtronic's next version, what they're going to call their advanced hybrid closed loop system, is called the Medtronic 780G. It is Bluetooth enabled. Um, it is expected to be able to uh, allow users to view their pump data on their phones, to update their, uh, upload their pump data wirelessly, and um, I also um, to be able to update the software in their pump remotely. And I think that's going to be a, a huge um, component of future technology is, you know, having to replace hardware, very expensive hardware, just because a new version of, of a CGM comes out or or um, you know, to being able to do that on a, on a much more frequent basis. When you think of the, the lifespan of an insulin delivery device being four years at a minimum in some, in some areas for funding reasons, five years, um, we wanna make sure that we can stay up to date and being able to remote, 
remotely update hardware is, is pretty um, critical as we move forward. Um, the Medtronic 780 will automate the delivery of correction boluses uh, when we're predicted to be um, ha have higher blood sugars. And um, the adjustable target, which is, is currently set at, at 6.7 in the 670, um, will be adjustable down to as low as 5.5 in the 780. Um, it is said to have fewer alarms and simpler operation than the 670. Um, it's targeting more than 80% time in range, which is an improvement over about the 71% um, we're seeing in, um, in real-time use of the 670. Uh, it will use the same CGM, the Guardian 3 uh, transmitter, which does still require two finger sticks per day, has a seven-day wear time. Um, and the FDA is apparently currently reviewing the Guardian CGM for non-adjunctive use, so being able to, to bolus insulin um, without uh, a, a confirmatory finger stick. Um, and one uh, of the studies that was presented at ATD, ATTD looked at um, people who miss mealtime boluses, like I was talking about earlier, and they looked at individuals who ate meals with 80 grams of carb, okay, pretty big meal, 80 grams of carb or less, and they missed their bolus completely. Uh, this system was able to keep um, people in range, so between 4.0 and 10, 73% um, of the time with a completely missed bolus. So it's certainly showing a step in the right direction that, that maybe there will come a day where we don't need to, um, where we don't need to actually warn the system of, of boluses. But I think for, for optimizing diabetes management now, uh, and, and until we have much faster, inter, uh, much faster insulins or, or perhaps um, other routes of delivery of insulin um, that are a lot quicker, uh, we're going to have to, um, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna have to be uh, okay with, with that 73%. Um, and according to Diatribe, uh, the U.S. targeted launch for 780 was mid-2020 for adults, and that, that, that they weren't clear whether that was going to be defined as 14 or 18 plus. Um, so that looks like their approximate timeline. Um, they also uh, showed at ATTD a new extended wear infusion set, so up to seven days of wear. I called this HCAP extended wear set. Uh, the goal it, with this system is to match the timing of your infusion set change with your sensor change so that, you know, you're only having to do one change every seven days. It also aligns with their CGM change. So perhaps if they're looking at an integrated sensor and infusion um, uh, site, that that potentially could be one site. We're all looking at trying to maximize real estate. And um, that, you know, this may, be, this may be one solution for doing that, though I'm not sure how they're going to get around with the current recommendations around, you know, there being a distance from our sensor uh, site, from our infusion insulin delivery site. I'm um, not sure how that's going to work, but hopefully it's something that we see one day. And 80% of these, these extended wear sites were still working on day seven, uh, according to the data presented at ATTD which is about the same as most of us experience with the current three-day um, infusion set options. And then just to, to tie back to that, this is a slide I got from ADA a couple of years ago, and it looked at you know, the systems that were already out in the near future, and I think this is where we're coming right now with Medtronic's uh, forecast and pipeline. And then long-term, this project duo, and, they, and many of you um, often ask about this is, you know, will there be that opportunity to wear a sensor and an infusion site in one thing? And it looks like certainly the evidence that we're seeing with this extended wear infusion site is moving in the direction of something uh, like this. Okay, so um, what about tandem? So many of you, uh, maybe there's some of our U.S. friends um, uh, joining us today. Uh, might have a more familiarity with Control IQ than I do, but Control IQ is, uh, has been approved um, for adult use in the US. Um, it will be a free software update for people in Canada who already have a Tandem insulin pump. Um, uh, that, that Tandem works uh, with the Dexcom G6. Um, and Control IQ will be the first system to bring automated correction uh, out on the market. So when, when glucose is predicted to be above 10, it's going to deliver 
that the algorithm delivers about 60% of the, the, the calculated correction bolus, and it brings aiming to bring us a, a, a down to a target of about 6.1. Um, and Control IQ uh, also includes automatic basal adjustment um, and predictive insulin suspension like, like basal IQ. Um, in in uh, one of um, Jen's notes from ATDD, I read, uh, someone described the uh, basal IQ as like a light switch, meaning like it turns off and turns on, and described control IQ as more of a dimmer switch, meaning you can turn it up, you know, a little bit and you can turn it down a little bit. And I really liked, really liked that analogy. And that's the direction that we're going with control IQ is to be more of a dimmer switch. Control IQ will target, um, you know, uh, uh, more aggressive targets and an even more tight range with something called sleep mode, um, which has, which will have tighter, tighter um, target ranges and exercise mode to allow us a little bit more um, flexibility with, uh, with exercise. It is available uh, currently in the U.S. So what's next for Tandem um, is something that they're calling this T-Sport patch pump. There's not a whole lot of information out there, but the little bit that I was able to find is that it's actually a mini version of the pump. It's about half the size of the current T-Slim pump, so it's very tiny. It is projected to hold 200 units of insulin. Um, it doesn't have any screen on it at all. Um, it can be worn as a patch with a very, very short infusion set, so it can actually be disconnected. Um, or you could wear it with a longer tube if you, you know, prefer tubing tubed pumps and put it in a pocket somewhere else. So we'll have flexibility with how it's worn. Um, and it will have an on pump bolus button, uh, which will be handy uh, if you're not in range of your phone or the, the automated controller, not sure whether it'll be operated by a mobile app or whether it'll be a separate uh, locked controller. Um, but you don't need to have that to be able to give a quick bolus, which I think will be um, a, a big bonus as well. And, um, there was something else about T-Sport I wanted to mention, and it has escaped me, but, um, but just the, the, the size uh, uh, alone, this little miniature version of the current pump looks pretty cool. Okay, so what's coming with Insulet? So Insulet has uh, lots of information on their pipeline on their website. Um, so for Canada, our friends in the US already have the Omnipod Dash system available. But for our um, Canadian friends, the, the Omnipod Dash, I would expect to see relatively soon here in Canada. Um, not, I'm don't, not sure of exact, their exact timeline for launch, but I would think it would be, be pretty imminent. Um, at, at Omnipod is also working with Tidepool um, to, to regulate a, a formal version of, of um, what they're going to call, you know, the, the Omnipod Dash system, but in a in a tide pool loop format. Um, tide pool is a, a, a nonprofit independent organization that's working closely with the FDA to regulate one of the open source uh, algorithms that's out there. And so this is a, a very exciting initiative that is uh, no, tub, no publications or no timelines public, published that I could find, um, but a really exciting initiative. Um, Omnipod's uh, own um, hybrid closed loop system is called the Horizon. And um, I think I have an extra slide on that in a second, but I just wanted to mention here that longer term, what Omnipod is focusing on, and I'm sure other companies uh, will be as well, but is using concentrated insulin. So we use U100 or 100 units per ml is the insulin that we use, most of us use but there are concentrated versions of insulin. So it might be 200 units per ml or 500 units per ml. And so you can see that that would allow a lot more insulin to be put into um, a much smaller device and in a much more compact space. So using concentrated insulins as we go forward might be a, a way to, well, is definitely a way to make, make our devices smaller. So exciting to see that that's, that's in their pipeline. So the Dash, um, what is it? It has a new PDM. It looks like an Android phone. It isn't a phone though. It is a, locked, a lockdown Android device. Um, it has Wi-Fi connectivity. It has that remote software update capability. It has, um, it's about the same size as the current PDM, um, but has a four inch um, color screen. It will have um, wireless uh, technology. 
um, uh, as well, and some some interesting apps that uh, that it will function with as well. And I'm just not sure about their availability for Canada, so can't comment too much there. Tide pool loop I've already talked about, but it's taking our, our the loop system as as uh, we you know many of us are familiar with, and and tying it into an official regulated um, system. And Omnipod Horizon is their hybrid closed loop system that we will be able to. Um, be able to control hopefully from a, a from a smartphone they are collaborating with both both Abbott and Dexcom they were targeting a late 2020 launch however um, in their pivotal trial I understand they, they had a little software glitch and that might have bumped their timing back to now I'm hearing a US launch uh, probably sometime uh, early 2021 for for Omnipod Horizon so more um, hybrid closed loop systems on the way um, Ipso, Ipso Pump and Ipso Med, uh, they plan to, uh, to integrate CGM data into their um, open source and sort of, sort of um, uh, they, they want to keep, um, keep the, the simplicity of their system um, and, and interoperability with other devices. And, and ultimately, they have an app now that works quite nicely with their pump with one-way communication. Um, but the goal would be, as many of us want to see, integration with our phone so that we can carry less devices and have the phone be the controller for, for insulin delivery. And, and I think we'll see that um, in, a, in a lot of areas. So what else is coming soon? I'm just having a look at the clock, so I leave time for questions. Um, is There's a few other companies that have products out there and available. Bigfoot, many of you may have heard of is uh, you know going way back uh, part of the original DIY you know we are not waiting community and they have they, they've had some changes in in the in the recent uh, past but they uh, are still on plan to target a launch for this uh, Bigfoot unity a kind of like an automated insulin delivery system that is for people on MDI so these are actually pens um, that would all communicate in a in sort of a closed loop system, but but geared to to somebody on on multiple daily injections who has no interest in pumping, um, but does have the insight and and direction uh, around automation for 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 insulin delivery on MDI. They also have a pump in the in the in the you know in the plans. They acquired the Asante Snap pump a number of years ago, but I, I would say the plans for launch on this are not publicly available and, and it appears that they're going to be aiming for launching Unity um, uh, relatively soon uh, relative to their pump technology or closed loop system. Diaba Loop, if I have any uh, European uh, friends in, in the group today may be familiar with this. It is approved for use in Europe for people who are uh, 22 years of age and older. It is automated and it uses some machine learning and artificial intelligence in how it operates. I found some really cool things in this system. Uh, it's got a very funky little, the pump comes in two different colors. It's similar to what we're gonna see with T-Sport with options on tubing length and things like that. It has these six configurable parameters, one of them being aggressiveness of the system. So you can tell it that you want it to be you know, very aggressive or you can tell it that you want it to be less aggressive. And I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. Um, the automatic optimization of carb ratio, you know, being able to, to learn from experience and then adjust uh, as the system goes. I think that sounds very cool. Um, and, um, you know, and there's, you know, some other, other criteria about Diaba Loop, but again, I don't have any insight onto when a North American launch for these guys might be. Islet by Beta Bionics, we've heard about this for, for many years now. Beta Bionics is a, is a public benefit corporation. Um, it is what they just def describe as a fully integrated bionic pancreas, and you can carry your glucose metabolism in your pocket. It's meant to be very plug and play, put in your body weight and go. There's not gonna be a whole lot of programming needed. Um, it, they, their plan is to launch as an insulin only algorithm, uh, followed by, you'll see this has two chambers, so one, assuming, will be insulin. The other chamber, hopefully one day, will be glucagon. And maybe we'll even see three chamber pumps for other hormones, perhaps one day um, down the road. But, uh, but um, dual hormone, uh, I think, as we can see, with the benefit of having little, little um, microboluses of, of glucagon along the way, we can see lots of reasons why that might be beneficial. 
Lily has an automated insulin delivery system. It's very difficult to find anything about what's going on. The most recent information I saw on this was from 2018, but they described their system as a, a disc shaped pump about the size of a shuffleboard puck. So about two inches wide, about half an inch thick. Um, it will use the Dexcom G6 uh, and a paired controller smartphone uh, app. Um, it will be a personalized system that will include uh, a, pe a pen as well as a pump and um, really difficult to find anything. I was not able to find any photos at all on what this thing's going to look like, but you can Google it and see what you can find. And I, you know, when we talk about, about do it yourself and, and where that community's at, and, and again, I know Kate addressed a, a lot of this this morning, so I'm not going to say too much. But, you know, when it comes down to imagine the brilliance of a product when it's designed by the people who use it. And that's really the benefit that the DIY community has brought to the space. And I, I, we have to give kudos to this community for driving forward the speed at which um, the regulation regulatory bodies are going are moving um, some of these up and coming devices. The speed at which they're going to move through the process is is um, has been driven by by these guys and a lot of hard work um, behind the scenes. So very cool things that are available now um, that are even well beyond my capabilities, but pretty impressive. Um, okay, let's talk glucose monitoring. As with pumps, we've come a long way. I laughed with people that this was my first Ames glucometer way back in the day, and I had to use this guillotine to get a drop of blood. Um, so when we look at where we've come, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty neat to see with Dexcom, uh, the G6 system with, um, you know, an all-in-one inserter, um, uh, iPhone integration or, or, or smartphone integration. Um, the G5, I still left on here because I know there are a number of G5 users. I know that G4 and G5 sensors are being phased out. Um, so just a heads up on that, but there are people still uh, happily still using their, their G4 and G5 systems. Um, the Freestyle Libre um, uh, intermittently scanned or flash continuous glucose monitor, sorry, flash glucose monitoring um, system. And I'll, I'll let you know on what's coming next with those guys. And then of course the Guardian uh, 3 CGM that's integrated in the Medtronic um, in their hybrid closed loop system. Okay, quick glance on time. So um, how nice is it to look at the time and to also see that my blood sugar is going straight up. Okay, uh, March 2018, uh, Dexcom was, uh, was uh, labeled or identified by the FDA as the first ICGM or this interoperable CGM. It is a, a less risky, less risk in, in terms of class of device. It works with different types of compatible devices. It will work with smart pens. It will work obviously with insulin pumps and, 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 and smartphones and, and perhaps other devices in the future. And because of this, this um, interoperable uh, ICGM rating, it does expedite the FDA regulatory review process. So, you know, the goal of being getting things in the hands of the user quicker, which is awesome. Um, and just to comment that, you know, this slide is a little dated now, it's two years old, and, but, and we know that people are using more forms of CGM, but if we come back to our original poll, there are still a number of barriers to CGM use. And although it has gotten better, um, you know, the vast majority of people with type 1 diabetes are still not using it. And I would say, you know, cost being a big barrier, um, but other things even around, you know, particularly in young people around, you know, having things stuck to their bodies. That's just not something that, that, that some are comfortable with. But, you know, at our best in, in the young age group, and this would be very parent driven, you know, uh, about 50% of type ones uh, as of 2018 were, were using CGM. And what's coming? So Dexcom uh, from, from G4 to G5 to G6, next is going to be G7. Uh, which has been put together with their, their partnership with Verily, uh, Google Life Sciences. And you can see the G7 is projected to be very thin, very, very small. It's meant to be a disposable transmitter. So the idea of having to replace your transmitter um, is, is going to be gone. They're aiming for lengthening the use of wear to, to 14 or 15 days. And also, uh, you know, I've seen the word more affordable. Um, has been put out there uh, for G7. And just to give you like, here's a, an American dime. This is, you know, uh, a, a graphic of the, the G7. So certainly moving smaller profile and, and maybe that will help with, 
with um, you know some of the the comfort around having things stuck to the body uh, as they get smaller and smaller. So in terms of what's coming with Abbott, the Freestyle um, Libre 2, really the only difference with this system, and it also, uh, I show the receiver here now that also has um, connection with, with, um, with smartphone readability, um, is, is it has alerts and alarms, so it will alert you, but it doesn't give you your reading when it alerts you, it'll alert you and say, oh, check, you know, uh, Dismiss the alarm, but scan me so I can give you your current reading. So this is certainly a huge benefit. I know that the, the Abbott Freestyle Libre 2 is also seeking that, that ICGM rating by the FDA. They, uh, you know, we, we speculate as to whether that might be one of the holdups for this system getting approval in the US or in North America. Um, but, you know, and the, and the question is, is, will they be able to achieve that? Uh, rating without giving an actual reading to the user when the alarm alerts. But certainly being able to, uh, uh, you know, I've always said that the best, the best um, value of, of CGM for me is alerts and alarms because I don't want to be bothered by diabetes unless I need to and I have my alarm threshold set at a level that I need to take action when it goes off. Um, as you can hear the buzzing, uh, if you can't, I'm vibrating right as we speak. Okay, um, just because I know I only have 10 minutes left and I want to leave a few minutes for questions, I'm just going to very quickly run through some of the other trends that are out there in terms of technology. Um, for those of you that are on MDI, and I know there weren't, weren't a, a whole lot on our on our um, original um, poll, but smart insulin pens are, are pens essentially that have cloud connectivity and they, um, you know, they, they will track when you took a, a dose, what time you took it, what type of insulin you took. And so for, for data collection and, and, and ongoing monitoring, um, smart pens are really moving um, quite quickly. There's a product in the US called the Companion Medical In Pen. It is a smart pen, um, pretty sleek looking, and it's, it's working uh, with a, a, a phone app. Um, and, and is currently available in the US. Uh, Novo has a, has a smart pen in the works, um, as do a couple, of, a couple of other companies, Lily as well. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is glucose trending apps. So you might you know, look at some of your software from your various diabetes devices now, and it might say, oh, hey, there seems to be a trend here of you, you know, going low after lunch. And maybe as a result of that, you should make a decision or maybe the, the apps will move to making dose suggestions or, or more specific um, you know, um, dosing recommendations uh, for, for people with diabetes and for, for their, their healthcare professionals around, around insulin dose adjustment. I think we'll see those types of systems uh, move quickly. And we want to use our phones. I mean, we carry phones every day, everywhere we go. And so being able to do the things, oh, that's not blousing, that's bolusing, but being able to do remote bolusing um, in using mobile interfaces for our closed loop insulin delivery just means we have to carry less stuff. I was joking with one of my um, groups of five last night on the, on the, the meet and greet, uh, during one of our icebreakers about my 25 pound purse that I carry around for all the, the stuff that, you know, we need to carry. And wouldn't it be great if we just had less stuff to carry every day? I'll touch really quickly on smart insulin. This is glucose responsive insulin. I think this would be very cool if it could, it's been in talk for eight, 10 years now. The idea that it turns on when we need it, it turns off when we don't need it in the form of an injection, a pill or a patch. It's been talked about for a long time. Lots of different companies have been in, the, in this space and there's really no new information to provide on this, although I think it could be really game-changing for a lot of us. Um, nothing really new to report there. And I just did a quick search and saw you know, three very cool things just pop up in this. These were all, I think, in the last month. Um, if any of you didn't see that there's some new research suggesting that type 1 diabetes has two distinct types. Big news there, um, I've argued that there's probably 50 different types within what we see uh, of how each of us is different with type 1, but there's a, a notable distinction for people who are diagnosed under the age of 7 compared to those of us who are diagnosed over the age of 13. So I asked, well, what does that mean for those that were diagnosed between seven and 13? Um, and that's sort of a, a mishmash category, but there's distinct differences in, in how type one shows up for us depending on age of diagnosis. 
Um, a smart contact lens, this is a little bit misleading. It can diagnose diabetes because you've probably heard for many years that there are contact lenses that are able to read glucose levels in the tear or the fluid of the eye, and then you know, give us a sense as to as, around glucose monitoring. Those devices have kind of gone by the wayside. And when it said treat diabetes, I thought that, oh wow, my, my contact lens is gonna hold insulin. Like, what does that mean? It actually will treat diabetes or retinopathy of the eye with diabetes. So you could put retinopathy, if you have retinopathy, you could put drugs to treat your retinopathy in your contact lens. So it does not, they will not treat your diabetes. Um, and then there's lots going on. And I think right at the same time as this session, uh, the JDRF was doing a research update, which I would be very curious to hear what's going on in the biological world with stem cells and, and other, um, you know, uh, potential cures. So I have said everything I could say as quickly as I possibly could. Um, where are we at for questions? Okay, I can definitely help in that department. Um, one question that actually came up in the chat box, and I'm going to ask that the answer to this goes back to the chat box. Someone asked early on if anyone had any details surrounding the new Fossil smartwatch, the Generation 5. So if anyone on the call is using that watch, um, if you've had any experience with that, if you can throw it in um, to the chat box, that would be great. Unless Lorraine, do you have a magic answer for that? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, we've had a couple questions about when will Control IQ come to Canada? Do you have any uh, ideas on timeline? No, I, it, it, it has been made public that it has been submitted. But um, with this COVID situation, um, I don't think any of us has any lens into how that might be impacting uh, Health Canada and the speed at which devices get through. It's always like, you know, throwing darts in the dark, trying to put any timelines together. So can't help you there. But I would expect, I believe Tandem's timeline is for, you know, late 2020, early 2021. So I may be way off on that, just a, just a guess. Okay. Um, someone asked this question in the chat box, so I'm just going to repeat the answer. They asked about um, any kind of artificial pancreas coming um, out, and I know, Lorraine, you did mention it in your um, chat, uh, in your conversation, but it's through Beta Bionics is the current one that's uh, in process. It's the Islet, and it's looking to come to the States in late 2021, but no word yet on Canada. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, really, artificial pancreas is a blanket term for closed loop technology. So um, beta bionics uses bionic pancreas as their, their terminology, but really all of these hybrid to fully automated closed loop systems are truly artificial pancreases. So all of those automated devices that I talked about, even you could make an argument that even the, the automated um, smart pens um, our artificial pancreas technology, certainly relative to what, to, to open loop. Our uh, open loop. Another timeline question, any idea when the G7 is expected to come to Canada? I did read something. I think they're aiming for, I, there's a, an early commercial U.S. launch targeted for end of 2020 with a more broad um, market launch in the U.S., early 2021. So what that means for Canada, I don't know. There may be some Dexcom folks uh, on the line, but again, with Health Canada, I would say mm -hmm. it's never a good idea to, to guess. <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question about uh, any information on Sensio uh, Sensionics, the implantable sensor. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have anything super insightful or um, up to date other than uh, right in the middle of COVID, they were one of the first diabetes companies to sort of announce, uh, um, I, I'm not even sure what their terminology is, but my understanding is they're, they're out of the game. I, I don't know what they're, whether their, their technology will be sold to some, somebody else, or I, I'm not sure if anyone else has more insight. All I know is um, they have exited the marketplace in the U.S., which is, I believe, the only country they were available. Okay. I didn't hear that. So uh, thanks. For, thanks. Actually, for the sorry, maybe I'm getting mixed up. They may, they might, I'm, I'm now that I think about it, I think I saw some European, um, I, I believe they're, they've had some availability in Europe, but yeah. Okay. Um, 
just uh, it might be nice to note that the Lily closed loop pump will have a made in Canada algorithm when it does come. Uh, and a question of what pump are you using now? <laughs> um, you know what? It's kind of pump of the week for me. I um, have different, uh, different, I'm fortunate to have different options and friends in high places that uh, have been able to let me try different things. Um, but depending on uh, whether I'm going to be around water or what my week looks like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm switching from system to system at this stage in the game. Okay, yeah. I'm using a Freestyle Libre. Just curious, do you think the Libre will be integrated with the T-Slim in the future? Yes, so Tandem um, and, Inc and uh, Abbott announced a collaboration, I believe that was last fall. Um, as has Insulet and uh, Abbott as well. And Bigfoot, their, um, their products or their, their pipeline is, is very heavily funded by Abbott and their integration is with, is with uh, the Libre as well. Or, or Libre 2 when it is available. Okay. Uh, is there an argument for having a dumb pump and CGM that can be accessed and controlled by a phone? A dumb pump that can be accessed and controlled by a phone. I mean, I, I sh I'm sure that that there are there are people that would find that that beneficial. Um, you know, I, I look at at a pump that's really just delivering insulin and dependent on the brains of the user for its function. So being able to do that um, just from a convenience perspective of having. Um, you know, being a woman who I wear a pump in my bra 90% of the time uh, or hidden away, I don't, I don't, being able to do and operate it even as a dumb pump from my phone, I think would be, would be tremendously beneficial. So yeah, but I also think that because automation is going to take so much of that work away and has already taken so much of that work away for, for a lot of us that, um, I think that that you know choosing not to use it is going to be for those laggards or those those very very late to adopt technology people would be my guess why not take advantage of it when it is really geared to make our lives so much easier okay this is our last question uh we have a researcher who's interested in using a cgm temporarily as part of a focus ethnography is it available through prescription without t1d you know what, there's some controversial comments online about people using uh, continuous glucose monitors for reasons other than diabetes or other kind of glycemic, you know, conditions of glycemic dysregulation, we would call it, um, which is, a, again, a very small number of people. Um, there's talk of cyclists and people that are trying to really optimize their, their physical performance, monitoring their glucose. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't honestly don't know because CGM, uh, CGM in Canada, it's not technic, it's not prescription per se. So I think, I think anybody who's willing to pay for it can probably get their hands on it. Um, whereas it is definitely a um, prescription item in the U.S. So um, I'm guessing that question was from an American. <laughs> I am not sure. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. So we are, uh, we're coming to the end of our webinar session here. So I, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of Connected in Motion and all of the participants who joined us, thank you so much, Lorraine, um, for spending your time with us and sharing um, all of your insights with the presentation that you provided us. Um, also for our participants, uh, you're getting lots of thanks and kudos in the chat box too. Uh, for our participants, what's up next? Uh, there is on the main uh, Connected Emotion webpage, there is a virtual Slipstream Cafe. So a couple of questions popped up that really are great ones to kind of survey a group. So that room is running um, all day. So you can pop into that. It'll be a bit of, a, a little bit of coincidence who might be in there at the time, but feel free to pop in there and you might get some great conversations um, going in the Slipstream Cafe room. 
Up next for everybody is Hot Topics. If you're choosing to come to that uh, session, um, that will be up at two. And following that are our top five webinars. So those will start um, at five o'clock and they're, they're shorter webinars that are uh, a fast five minute tips uh, to help in each of the dedicated categories that are there. So I encourage everyone to keep connecting uh, throughout the day today. And thanks for joining us and Lorraine. Bye everyone.